Imagine getting up every day full of energy as if you were in your 20s again. What would that be like? What would it be worth to you? What is your health worth to you? Think about it. Your health isn't everything, but without it, everything else is nothing. And yet, too many of us are taking it for granted until something goes wrong. And no one wakes up hoping to be diagnosed with a disease or chronic illness. And yet, we've never been taught how to be proactive in our health through our school or public health. As a registered health coach and integrative health practitioner, I believe it's time this information is made available to everyone. Combining new knowledge around your health and the ability to do my functional medicine lab tests in the comfort of your own home will allow you to optimize your health for today and all your tomorrows. Don't wait for your wake up call. Welcome back to the Don't Wait for Your Wake Up Call podcast. My name is Melissa Dealey. I am your host, and I'm super excited to be bringing you another amazing guest today, Carrie Castle. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. Very, very honored. Thanks. I'm very excited to have you. So Carrie is an internationally known professional author, keynote speaker, registered dietitian of more than 30 years, a certified life coach. And since the age of 13, she has been called to serve in wellness. So Carrie, I would love for you to just share a little bit about your story that since the age of 13, you've been called to wellness. Most people don't realize it at such a young age. So I'd love to have you share. I didn't know it at the time either. I was grabbing the nutritional almanac book off the shelf at my parents' place. They were selling vitamins for a distributor company. And uh, so books and vitamins were around me. I think, you know, when you connect the dots, it all makes sense now. And while my friends were reading Vogue magazine, I was reading nutritional almanac and I actually thought that was normal. And it was fast forward, you know, sitting in a biology class, biology 30, And I knew about these vitamins that were being taught about. And my girlfriend from behind whispers, how do you know that already? And I thought, don't you know that already? (laughs) So apparently not. Uh, So I, again, thought it was normal. And it sort of made me realize, oh, if I have a natural interest for this, maybe I explore alternative medicine and ended up in alternative medicine. And it was there that I would start asking a lot of questions and how does that vitamin work? And I just had such a strong curiosity and it led me to becoming a dietitian. So I have a great background in terms of alternative and non-alternative medicine that I combine. I think it's kind of unique, but at the same token, I'm very, very passionate about it. So I don't know if it's so unique or I just feel that I've just been pulled in the right direction. Well, I can absolutely feel your passion and I love that. And I love like that all around background that you have, right? Because we now know the body heals best when we're looking at the whole body, not just one piece of it. And so having that well-rounded background allows you to, you know, give so much more to your clients as a result. Definitely. In fact, uh, I didn't feel that it was well-rounded. Summers around hitting 40, I hit perimenopause and felt that what I was giving in terms of my nutrition and both backgrounds, I thought were having a wonderful impact. But then when I was going through my own, call it ailments, I realized, oh, there's some missing pieces. And until you're going through things and you don't have a white picket fence, you realize, oh, there's other things within the curriculum. So it was actually throwing on a life coach hat. I became a life coach as well. Then I discovered all this, uh, the treasure trove of missing tools. And when you mentioned whole in terms of uh, addressing things within a person, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody came to me and they have emotional eating Mm -hmm. and it might be sugar, which we might talk about here today. And (laughs) if they have an emotional eating, maybe it's connected to They had a fight with their spouse, a teenager, and that's a trigger. And they don't realize this emotional connection. As a dietitian, I was maybe able to say, you know, thou shall not eat sugar or some sort of messaging like that, but not addressing the emotional piece and connecting it to relationships was a missing link for me. Now I have the tools to be able to bridge the two Mm -hmm. and get to the root of the problem or the challenge or the situation 
And that now is holistic to me. And I do that by assessing four main areas of your life, which is health, career, relationship, and time and money. Mm -hmm. Like four wheels on a vehicle. You don't just uh, check the balance on one. And if you're over inflating one or under inflating another, your vehicle drives out of balance. So I look at the whole, as you said, that's great. I love that you said that. Well, I love how you've explained all of that great analogy with the four wheels on the car and, you know, looking at all four aspects of someone's life in helping them overcome emotional eating, because you're right. There are triggers that cause it that they may not be aware of until they work with someone who can help them unpack it, you know, peel back the layers of the onion. Right. And so I love that you do that because when I started my work, guiding people on their healing journey, it was for the same reason, right? I had experienced going to a naturopath and it wasn't actually for me, it was for my kids, but figuring out their food intolerances, being told not to eat these foods. And then that was it, right? I was able to do that for my children, but it made me think, well, what if it was me? And now I'm being told not to eat these foods and I'm already feeling like crap. And now I have to figure out new recipes and new ingredients. And I don't know what these are and is it really going to work? And my brain's chirping at me and all of these things that can so easily pull us off. But when we combine what we know from science and the, you know, emotional aspect of healing and supporting and what our brain is doing, it's our best friend when it's keeping us from stepping in front of our bus, but it can be our worst enemy when it's keeping us in our comfort zone right? Sure. And we need to move out of it. So I love, I love that you have both because I think, you know, you can really serve your clients well. So that's amazing. Yeah. It's extremely impacting and it's, it allows to give a poetic license for where we are in our journey on this planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, from multitude of, we could look at the pandemic, we could look at all sorts of things to, to explain that, but we have uh, a subconscious and a conscious brain, and you're alluding to that. I'm sure yes. you're very aware of it as well, that our subconscious makes up 90, 95% of our brain and our conscious mind makes up five to 10%. So we have all this DNA and ancestral and uh, mechanisms that are happening. In other words, we don't have to think about breathing. It happens automatically. But if I stop and think about my breathing with my conscious mind, I can change it. And that subconscious is so in touch with all internal mechanisms. Do you have enough food on board? Uh, Do you have enough nutrients on board? And it will make adjustments accordingly. And if we're not understanding how to work with that, I believe that's where we slip and fall. And then, and it's not a fault of ours that we weren't taught this. And most diet programs, ironically, because we might talk about my book, for instance, which is called the domino diet. Mm-hmm. Please let me elaborate on that when it come, when the time comes. Definitely. Most diets don't equip us with with the mind part. Yes, they set us up to say that willpower will be enough, but it really is not unless you don't understand how to collaborate the two brains that we all carry. And we're new on the planet of having abundance. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that before, so all of our or many of us are, are have an upbringing with scarcity thinking and lack thinking, such as eat everything on your plate. Yes. As if there's starving children in the world, which A, didn't solve anything by eating everything on your plate. (laughs) But unfortunately, our ancestors only knew that type of thinking to pass down to us. And now we have stores in every corner. You can buy two for one and we have abundance, but so we're new to that. So understanding how to work with that, I think is so key in setting goals with the conscious mind. So true. I love everything that you've said there. And I, I use that same analogy of, you know, your parents told you to eat everything on your plate because there's children starving in Africa. And when I'm referring to it, it's usually around food sensitivities that we've lab tested to see what they are. And the person's like, well, it can't be that food. I've eaten it my whole life. Mm. But what's happened is because they kept getting told to eat it as a child. And they were probably saying, I don't want to eat it. And the parent isn't listening to the child because the parent's doing what they think they know best. The child is, doesn't have good vocabulary to truly say what's going on. Like it gives me gas or it gives me pain. They're just saying, I don't want it. And we stop listening to our body's cues. 
over time. But as we get into adulthood, we reach a tipping point with our toxic load and then the ongoing onslaught and inflammation caused by continuing to eat foods that our body struggles to digest until some other pain happens that makes us take notice. And then we do the lab and then we remove the foods and they're always astounded at how good they feel. And it doesn't mean we have to remove them forever either. It's just removing them long enough to allow the digestive system to be healing and the inflammation level to be coming down. And I don't know if you talk about this in your book, but our microbiome is individual to each of us as individual as our fingerprints. And so to your point about diets, so often we're looking at the diets because the magazine on the shelf at the checkout counter says, she, I lost 30 pounds in 30 days and you can too. And then we try to follow it. It worked for her. Why won't it work for me? And then it doesn't. And then that can lead to more emotional eating because now we're beating ourselves up that we're a failure. And it's not that we're a failure. It's that our body is different to that person's body. And that diet isn't necessarily going to work for me. Yeah. Um, I have so many analogies as you're speaking. <laughs> we know which one do I pick? <laughs> um, to a degree. I mean, we're 6 billion or so, whatever, 7 billion people running on this planet with hearts and digestive systems and brains. So uh, to me, it's sort of like having a house. We have walls and a floor. That's a foundation. That happens for almost every home, except for maybe a TP and an igloo, but just bear with me for a moment. <laughs> yeah. But we, within the home, we have different size rooms and uh, bore, uh, paint colors. And so there is some customization within that, but there are some foundational principles, period. Absolutely. Our brains require a certain amount of nutrient, our bone skeletons. We all walk with a skeleton, both men and women. Um, you know, there's some stereotypical things such as women need more calcium. No, men have a skeleton as well. So there's, uh, there's a little bit more tweaking required in the customization of what you just described, mm -hmm. microbiome or otherwise. But one of the beauties is, I mean, it can be so complex in the sense of an iceberg, you know, the tip of the iceberg is I have cravings right. or triggers, but underneath that is so many things as you're alluding to. And if we could pause and just really dial into our intuition, mm -hmm. pause and understand which is part of what I really focus in on the book is being able to breathe and switch into the parasympathetic system which I call the r, &R system for simplicity in the book versus being in fight flight response, which is our knee jerk trigger primary response nowadays. Anyway, we digest, we completely have different systems, hormonal systems occurring, how we absorb nutrients based on that simple technique. So yes, we can go to a lab. Yes, we can analyze data. We can look at blood work, but if we don't go to the basic foundation, we miss on some of the easiest, simplest, cheapest ways of absorbing food, which is to breathe into the parasympathetic. Yeah. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. I am. And to turn our digestive system on. I do teach this all the yeah. time. So I love that you brought that important. up. Mm -hmm. It's very important. If we want proper absorption of what we're eating and for the nutrients to actually get to the cells that need it, mm -hmm. body has to be able to break it down. But if digestion is turned off... Yeah. Yes. then that's not happening, right? And yes. so that is what's causing for some people digestive issues because they're eating in that stressed out state and they don't realize it because it isn't taught. Like I didn't learn this in high school or through public health, et cetera. So I love that you've put it into your book. So the domino effect, it's not yeah. out yet, right? It's coming out soon? No, or no, it is. It's out uh, now? It, oh, it's awesome. It's launched on August 31st. So it's still very fresh, Um and it, it's hit bestseller. So yeah. It's oh, congratulations. Food. It's called the Domino Diet. Um, a, lot of, a lot of me wants to explain that word diet because it has a negative connotation. And I actually fought with the title that came to me in the middle of the night. You know, one of those things that occurs. Yep. <laughs> right. I actually seen these dominoes happening in the middle of the night and it makes me sound a little bit woo woo here, but that's what, that's what happened. And I argued back and forth with, I don't want the word diet, it's negative. And, and then something told me to go back to the original meaning of it. Right. And it downloaded for me, oh, I know what that is. And so 
Nowadays, I'm known as what's the, called the diet diva. Why? Because the word diet comes from the origin dieta, a Greek origin word dieta, which means a way of life. And it's only in the last, what, three decades, maybe, maybe four decades, that diets have become what we call fad diets, programs, off kilter, sacrifice, guilt cycles. But that wasn't the intention of the word. And wouldn't it be nice to bring it back to be a way of life where it isn't so mixed up and it isn't guilt cycles. And so I think you, you were alluding to that earlier that we get on this uh, track and then we don't do well and then we feel guilty for it. So if it was set up sim simply and we could go to breath and we could go to our thoughts and we could actually still enjoy chocolate, but just not portion distortion of whatever the case might be we could have it be a way of life. And so I just love the concept of the word diet now. <laughs> so it doesn't have a negative connotation to me. And I feel like I'm actually a dietitian on a mission to bring back the true meaning of the word diet and put the heel back into health because health itself has become such a chopped up word. Young mm -hmm. girls think it's looking at a, a certain way as Hollywood dictates or uh, Vogue magazines would dictate. Those same magazines that the checkout counter dictate. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And no, nobody has a degree or the background in science. It's a lot of anecdotal information. And yet it's educating a lot of our young people. And that that becomes the notion of health mm -hmm. instead of let's breathe and pause actually at meals and not have the news happening and anything that puts us in fight flight. So let me just address for a second. Mm -hmm us running from a mammoth or fighting with our spouse or fighting with our teenager or driving in traffic while eating is no different to the body chemistry. And as you've taught your clients from what I've, what I understand here, that's not a recipe for any digestion and absorbing of nutrients. So then we go and find supplements and all sorts of other things to try and uh, cover up band-aid what we could just so easily do and maybe become creatures of default into the calm parasympathetic system where another set of hormones exists, where diseases would lower, more serotonin comes in, and it would offset cortisol, which is in the fight flight response. And we would probably fill up quicker, not need as much food, not need as much chocolate. <laughs> so it's, a, it's like the domino effect in that direction just by breathing. Mm hmm and absolutely have true. I said this enough, I, I repeat a lot because I'm just so passionate about it. And I, I absolutely love it. And everything you're saying, I agree fully with. And to your point about the hormones coming in, when we slow down, we're yeah. giving our leptin hormone, which is our fullness hormone, that time to tell us we're getting full, yes. right? Yes. As which also as ties into sleep, which is also from the serotonin. Yeah, it all ties exactly. together. It all ties together. Um, I love your comment, portion distortion there. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to say, so somebody said to me once about the word diet, the way that they had justified it in their mind, because, you know, as we're creating habit change, et cetera, we do in that process need to create mindset change, right? And yes. we've got triggers that cause us to act one way. And so then we need new triggers that cause us to act another way. And that will often come with having a different mindset. So she said, diet is simply, did I eat today? Hmm. Right. And that was a good one for her because that was somebody in the corporate world that would have, you know, her breakfast, trying to eat healthy, but have her breakfast at like 6am in the morning and leave and go to work and work, 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 and not ever slow down for lunch. Right. Yes. And then yes you know, get something for dinner at eight or nine o'clock at night and then try to go to bed on a full stomach. Right. Yes. And so it's not only about what we eat and if we're in our parasympathetic nervous system when we're eating, but it's also about the timing of our meals and not eating immediately before going to bed and then going to bed while our body's still digesting and that's negatively impacting our sleep or yeah. going too long between meals or the yeah. flip side of eating too often. Now, yes, there are certain groups that might need to eat more often than others, but in general, the timing of when we eat matters as well. Yeah. Or, you know, there are uh, work scenarios where, you know, it's not easy to slip off and have a snack, but mm -hmm. understanding food digestion, 
accordingly, if you're a kid in sports or you're an athlete, period. If you understand food digestion, you can fuel your body for that sport, but not too much. There's a lot of fine tuning. So I do talk about it in the book, how carbs digest proteins and fats and fiber. And then you can really customize your meals accordingly. And I think that's, well, we're not taught that, but I think it would be really, really key, especially in the corporate world you just described. I just hopped off the phone before coming on with you here and uh, a gal who is having heartburn, a lot of heartburn. And really when we get down to it, it's the coffee on the empty stomach in the morning. And I'm not saying no coffee, but to have small, something small, she says, Mm -hmm. I can't have breakfast. Well, Sometimes that word is daunting uh, we, because we don't have the time we're saying in our minds, but we can begin small. We can begin having something to buffer. So right. we can otherwise come down to the choice of, well, do you want your coffee or do you want your, yeah, do you your, want your heart 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 later? <laughs> oh, no, I'm willing. If I have to give up my coffee, now I'm really willing <laughs> to play ball. So um, it comes down to that customization again, but your intuition is probably telling you. She was really hearing a small voice. Right. Telling them maybe you should eat a breakfast. Maybe you should eat a breakfast. Right. And the thing with our wonderful intuition, it's never booming or loud. Right. It's when it's subtle. Um, but pay attention. If you pause, you'll you'll hear it. <laughs> right. And then you know, some people just want that um, support of what their intuition is telling them through seeing an expert like you, right? Because they haven't heard it before and now all of a sudden they're hearing it and they're just doubting themselves. Exactly. Um, But training anybody on that, you know, it's not something we were taught in school. Exactly. And so that's that other side of the brain pulling us back into the comfort zone to doubt ourselves. Right. And, but just taking that action, even if you're hearing it, instead of just ignoring it, take that step to reach out to somebody who can confirm that what your intuition is telling you is right so that you can keep moving forward. Absolutely. So um, yeah, portion distortion. Let's talk about that in relation to sugar. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great one to use with. Um, I don't know where, where you want me to go with sugar because I can spiel on about that. <laughs> but what I will say from a dietitian's point of view mm-hmm. is unfortunately out there messaging is so confusing. Yes. I mean, our, our bodies, A, need sugar. Yes. Uh, B, we convert so many foods to sugar in our body. Yes. Be it from grains, be it from fruit, be it from even milk and milk products. There's a plethora of ways that we convert to sugar in our body. And if we were to say, I will eat less sugar, that subconscious brain is listening and it does not like that messaging. Because it, it is busy trying to pump your heart, inflate your lungs, your digestive system, feed your brain. And it is 24 seven autopilot doing that. And as soon as it dips down that we're not getting enough food supply, it'll make for cravings quick, like, and then we're berating ourselves because we're craving sugar. So I always like to premise the point that it's not about a negative about sugar being a fuel as much as your vehicle needs the gasoline and you put it in the tank and you fill it up. But what happens when you start to fill it up to the point of full overflowing <laughs> <It> overflows, <laughs> or I like to use the analogy with tires because I do talk about the four tires on the vehicle. If you take that air to the tire and you, you, you obviously need it or you're not going to drive anywhere, take the air to the tire and overfill it and it could burst or there's damage or it drives your vehicle out of balance. So honestly, it's the same analogy. You need some sugar, not too much. And that is so different for everybody. Mm -hmm. You're an athlete, you're a couch potato, you're a desk worker, you're a postal worker. It is so different for everyone that it does require some customization. Um, At the very end of the day, it's, it's never, if if it's a sugary food, it will enter your digestive system and probably only last within about five to 30 minutes. I wouldn't even say 30 minutes is a bit, it's a bit of a stretch. And it's not even about the sugar so much as it's the insulin that's required to have that sugar go into our cells, like a key that opens the door to our cells. And insulin is a fat storing hormone. So it's kind of a double whammy when we're overdoing portion distortion with sugar or fat or protein or carbohydrates, period. So that's my introductory spill 
on sugar. If you have specifics about that, I'm happy to answer that, but it's really important that I don't premise it that it's negative. No, I totally understand. And I fully agree with you that, you know, the body needs the sugar, it's converting it to glucose, it's taking it to the cells that need it, et cetera. But yeah. it is the portion distortion because we have so many people that are going down that path to being type two diabetics because of that insulin response and then the body becoming resistant, right? So um, I would love you to talk to like, are there, you know, good sugars and bad sugars, for instance, that you would like to share with the audience or better sugars? I think that's what people would like to know is we're not, we need sugar. We don't want to avoid all sugar, but what sugar options are better than others, for example? At the end of the day, um, I'm, one of my specialties is in diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I've had the privilege of working with these individuals with their glucometers sitting beside them so that we can actually measure their sugars immediately right. and all these wonderful tests mm -hmm. that you and I wouldn't be able to pick up on the same details unless our pancreas is similar. And it's not necessarily the sugar, by the way, that and I know you know this, but I just want to make sure our audience does that. It's not sugar that leads to the diabetes. It's often actually an insulin resistance, as you mentioned. Um, but it, if you're an apple shape, you're mm -hmm. more likely. Mm -hmm. So that can be coming, that can come from overeating protein and overeating fat and the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the end of the day, sugar is really, really uh, where would they have to pay a lot of attention? And it, when it comes down to what type of sugar, when, when you have a candy, for instance, usually that sugar is going to be dextrose. It's the, the simplest molecule to enter your system. So in fact, if you have somebody who's having a low blood sugar, that's the best thing to give them. Because right. it'll re rectify that in a, in a heartbeat, so to speak. And then if you have fruit, for instance, it's called fructose, which is a couple of molecules, not just one molecule. So it takes slightly longer to break down. But that fruit may also have skins or fiber, for instance, anytime there's fiber, it takes even longer to break down. This would be our goal to find ways to consume our sugary kind of containing foods where there's more fiber um, wrapped around with it. So now in other words, if you have an apple and you have a little bit of, you know, peanut butter with it or some sort of combination, it would slow down the spiking of that sugar. Therefore you would need less insulin in the first place. So that's one way of answering your question. If it's more about natural sugars, such as honey, molasses, and there's a plethora out there nowadays. If, if I was working with a diabetic, for instance, they, their sugars would spike, you know, only, um, there'd be only about two minutes difference, for instance, right. Right. table sugar to honey versus molasses. There's right. very little difference. Mm -hmm. So it's important that people know that natural is still going to cause some of the similar effects. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like the fact that molasses has iron, B12, right. and a few other things. So there can be other, um, it's not such empty calories coming in right. if you're using death other sources, but portion distortion still to be aware of with those sources as well. Um, there's other types of shit like uh, lactose, which is in yogurt and milk, milk and so forth, which is also in a couple of molecules combined. The other advantage is that there's protein. So it does slow down slightly. So there's better in that sense. I don't know if I'm answering your question. You totally are. And, and it still means to watch the amount. <laughs> yes. And I love what you're saying about slowing down that, you know, insulin spike, I've been actually calling it lately, the flattening of the curve. Because it applies <laughs> here. Because people understand that. Exactly. <laughs> it applies here as well. Sure. Um, can you talk to sugar alcohols at all? Yeah, in sure. terms of um, yes. better or good options, bad options, or are they all the same? Um, what uh, it's on sugar it's very individual for one. So they enter this, the system slower as well. Mm -hmm. They break down slower. Mm -hmm. mannitol, zorbitol, all, anything that ends in all usually is something, if you look at yep. the label and indicator, but for our, some people, it does cause stomach problems or digestive issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just say that you found a protein bar and it says, you know, low sugar of some kind, you know, that by looking at the label it says, Oh, two grams of sugar, which would be considered low, but looking at the ingredient list, it may have alcohol sugars mm -hmm. and Many haven't made the connection. Oh, that's why in the morning I have 
stomach issues if, if say that's when they consumed it. So I always like to warn people that a, it's not going to give you a fuel source. So you could feel sluggish later, pay attention. Mm-hmm. And number two, uh, digestion for not, you know, for some, not everyone, it can be an issue. Uh, for my diabetic clientele, it sometimes is worth it because the protein combined, they get a sweet flavor, get rid of some of the cravings, mm-hmm. but there's still calories and there's still consideration that way. But it's, it's not a terrible option. I just wouldn't call it my only go-to right? for that reason. What is your go-to for diabetics? What do you recommend? Uh, I, f- I would work with them first mm-hmm. um, in terms of, and, and a lot of this discussion is called the glycemic index. It's probably right. something you've heard. Mm-hmm. It weaves in and out. It's very popular in Australia, for instance, but in Canada and the US, it's it weaves in and out in our dialogue. Uh, but generally I like to combine things. So if you're having a sweet craving, A, if it's chocolate, uh, I would probably just suggest good quality over quantity, right? Go for good quality (laughs) over quantity. Sometimes in fact, it'll sell, it'll save a second helping by having one good square Mm -hmm. chunk of good quality chocolate, dark chocolate. Yep. There's antioxidants, some good things about that. There's Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. Right. When it turns into the whole chocolate bar. So that would be one avenue. If I'm working with somebody who craves chocolate Mm -hmm. uh, for somebody else, Oh, it's just, you know, I'm looking for sweets. I first would look at, are you spacing your meals too far apart? Mm -hmm. Have you had enough carbohydrate intake in your day? Because you'll start craving sweets because your body's looking for that sugar. Right. So that's um, one of those, but if it's more of a trigger, I, you know, it's not even about hunger. It's just a trigger. I usually will try to combine again, if it's a trail mix, even. Right. So I would take things like uh, nuts, dried fruit, a handful of chocolate chips, something like that, right. and make that batch last for quite some time into baggies. So mm-hmm. that it's not a thou shall not. It is, again, a portioning, but it's it's done with uh, more nutrients added in. I just poked a few more nutrients in. Raisins have more iron. So I'm looking at it is possible that they're nutritional deficient. And depending on if I'm working with women or not, iron can be an issue. So these are some of the things that I'll try to twist together. So it's a bit of customization in that sense. Uh, frozen grapes help some people because it takes longer, but it gives yeah. a sweetness, especially when you freeze them. Mm-hmm. Frozen half bananas yep. dipped in a tiny bit of Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> So these are sugar containing, but there, you can see I'm saying a bit of portion distortion of yes. it being squished down there. Yes. And something that I know is really helpful for people is to mindfully enjoy those, right? So again, we're Definitely. back in that sympathetic nervous system and we're yes. not putting a fistful of the trail mix in our mouth at a time, but you know, almost being like little chipmunks and just nibbling away at it right. and really choosing to enjoy it. Because again, when we do that, um, we, we get full faster and or sa- satiated by what we're eating. And we don't feel like we need to eat the entire bag or whatever it is that you're yes. um, eating out of, right? Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm going on a limb here and having worked with some people to say that this is what happens for some. Mm-hmm. When there's a binge episode. Mm-hmm. A, you could have gone too long without eating. Usually three to four hours without eating is a potential trigger. And let's say you've gone grocery shopping. You got the groceries, you go in the house and you've set them down. It's near to supper. You're hungry. You're starving. So you're starting to put things in this cheek and in this cheek. <laughs> and the binge episode is about to happen potentially. Or you bought the cake and you intended it's going to be for later, but you start to have this potential binge trigger. Often I think what happens is we want to do it so fast so that we don't stop and listen to that voice that talks mm-hmm. us out of it. That's a really we good We don't thing. want to get talked out of that. We want to enjoy <laughs> that without the guilt keys. And we would rather like our teenager that's still inside of us too, just like our child mm-hmm. would rather do the forbidden and get punished afterwards. Right. Rather than be robbed of the enjoyment. Right. So if you're prone to binging and you're prone to that, that, that feeling, I would go back to how it's being set up in the first place. It should, here I go to say should, 
It should not be a should not. It shouldn't be a thou shall not. It should be a how can I weave it in? Do I bring chips in my home at all because I might be more tempted? Or do I do a compromise with popcorn? That's what I do. Instead of thou shall not. Right. So it's it's a compromise that works with marriages. It works yeah. with teenagers. <laughs> and it works with our psyche in terms of allowing ourselves. Yes. The 80-20 rule, which I know you believe in as well. Yeah. Anytime we go into that full-on denial mode, then that's when the brain gets really scared and starts totally firing up. So the thou shalt not, the denial absolutely doesn't work. And And the subconscious likes specifics. If mm -hmm. you say, I will eat less sugar, you can't cash a check that says less sugar, less or more. But if you specifically say, I will have one sweet a day. And you have that as your dangling carrot, pardon the Mm -hmm. pun. Uh, you'd be surprised, you know, by the end of the day, and it doesn't feel like a guilty thing if you've set it up. Yeah, and the subconscious feels good about that. In fact, I often suggest while as you have your supper, and before you put the plate in the dishwasher and so forth, while you are full, put your snack item on the counter that might be had, you know, around eight o'clock, depending on your supper time, depending on what you ate, and that's a whole (laughs) different well. <laughs> exactly. but to put that small portion dessert be it a little ice cream be it whatever it might be already ready to go instead of going and then sitting and watching tv and then talking yourself in and out in and out of having that snack or not and then you start searching the pantry in your mind and searching the fridge in your mind and before you know it you're you're losing out because you've triggered up so many cravings and the subconscious is with you thinking about what you've watched on TV and so forth. Anyway, planned, thou shall, it's okay. And your subconscious mind isn't going to trigger the same. Exactly. Because we know that what you focus on expands, right? So as soon as you start focusing on those images of the pantry or the fridge, then it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger, but you're not going to focus on it. If you've already know what you've had, you've told your subconscious, I'm going to have my one suite and it's set out and it's there for you. So I love that as a strategy. Um, before we end, I have, I have a question for you just because of the timing of this episode coming out, which is right before Halloween and we're talking about sugar. Ah. (laughs) So I would just love to ask if you have any tips for people around Halloween, because, you know, you get these boxes of 90 pieces of candy and you're going to give them out and then you still have a bunch left afterwards. Right. What do you recommend around that for people? I'll, I'll, as you may have noticed, I answer with long responses. <laughs> one, number one, I'm, I was the kindergarten mom for <laughs> a stack for Halloween. Lucky me, dietitian. My daughter comes to me, you know, the night before. Hey, you're the snack oh. tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, and I'm a, you know, I want to represent in health. But bing, I had an idea. So I'm saying this for other moms out there as well. I had all the children take uh, Japanese oranges, Chinese, whatever you want to call those. Mandarin oranges. Yeah. Mandarin oranges, thank you. And I, you know, they all had the ability to draw little skeleton or jack lantern type faces on them. And then I took one jube jube, green or black, they could choose to put on the top to represent the stem. Those kids ate those oranges and they enjoyed the little jube jube afterwards. It was one little jube jube because they were part of the interaction and creating their own faces and the assuring and sharing. And it was such a download for me that it wasn't so much about the actual sweets. It's a lot of the hype. It's the, the showing and the kids. And ever since then, that's what we do in our household. We begin our, our jack-o'-lanterns with those oranges. So that's one. Uh, the other is with the type one diabetic children that I've worked with over the years, I would suggest to them that they pour out their bag, select out their most important precious items, and then bag up the rest for the candy fairy to come take away that will be replaced with a toy. And that leads me to the next point. It doesn't have to be all candy. There can be pencils, there can be all sorts of things, stickers that can be part of the trick or treat reward systems and I just try not to have too many of the 
the temptations in my house. Luckily, the little bags of chips are the equivalent of one slice of bread and a teaspoon of butter. Okay. So it's not terrible because they're small. Right. Luckily, the arrow bar, the little mini guy, is equivalent yeah. to two cubes of sugar. Okay. As opposed to the ones with caramel and so forth, which will be more like three. Luck- luckily, the Kit Kat. I probably shouldn't be doing brand and endorsement right now, but <laughs> some of them. Some, some of them are better than others. This is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> If the, if the label says uh, five grams of sugar, mm-hmm. it's equivalent to four, one cube of sugar. It's actually right. four, but I like to work with fives. It's easy math. Yeah. My brain. And so these little chocolate bars, the minis are usually about 10 to 15. They're not the problem. Enjoy one. It's the three or four or five. And so I, I just personally don't buy them in my home because other little fingers around here don't need them. They can trick or treat bring a few home and then that's it. That's awesome. Well, I love all of those tips. Thank you so very much. Yes. It's, it is such a tough time. And in our neighborhood, we have dentists and I actually really loved it. Oh, yeah. they, would, they would give out a little a toothbrush and tooth floss, right? Right. Kids didn't necessarily think it was great, but as a parent, I thought that was brilliant, right? They're going to need a lot it. Of creative ideas. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So uh, we've talked a little bit about your book. I definitely want to get your book myself. And I do recommend the audience here to grab that. Um, We'll put the link to uh, it on Amazon in the show notes for everyone. So the the Domino Diet. Um, But who is your ideal client? I know you've talked about different clients that you work with, but do you have a particular ideal client? So if someone's listening, they're going to be like, oh, that's me. I need to reach out. It's, It's so... It used to be, I could have answered that question just point blank. You know, I worked with diabetes or now I have, after having, you know, menopause experience myself, I addressed that a lot in the book. I actually call it menopause, manopause and menopause (laughs) because I think a little bit of humor in there is really important. Um, So there's that clientele, but then I actually worked with a gentleman that I just love and weaved his story throughout about how he had gout and how his desire to drive up a vitality in life was just kind of dismal. But when we discovered his dream of being a musician, mm-hmm. it rectified his whole desire of health. So to answer that shortly, it's it seems to be people that have maybe hit that 40 to 60, 70-ish range. Right. And they feel like their vanity has the desire of vanity starts to go down. Right. Vitality is trying to pick up the slack, but eh, they're tired and it's extracting a few other things that I have little tools with that seem to be the, the game changer, which I love doing. So it's those clientele, both men and women. That's awesome. And I, I totally get it. We, we get told to niche down, but then you have all sorts of different people coming to you. So I have the same problem with answering that question. But as you said, some people know exactly what it is. Yes. So um, what does don't wait for your wake up call mean to you? For me, um, the privilege, again, of working with so many individuals who were diagnosed after the fact, who were told, you know, you, you, you had prediabetes, then there's diabetes. And once you hop over the fence, there's diabetes. We could talk about that. That's a different topic altogether. But the fact <laughs> remains, as many of them would say to me, gosh, I wish I would have known. Gosh, I wish I would have not seen myself as invincible um, because it's, it's a burden. Uh, it can be a burnout burden mm-hmm. to think about every morsel that goes in your mouth, every activity that you do, taking food with you, what kinds of foods, measuring your sugars, medications, that's just one diagnosis. There's so many diagnoses and it, there is this sort of, well, I'll wait until there's a panic, a fear, a reason to really dial into health. But unfortunately, fear only lasts usually about six months in terms of long-term results. And then we tend to go back into our, you just described the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Um, So if I'm answering correctly, it's don't, don't wait for the diagnosis. Trust me. It's uh, regrettable for most people. There's only a few that would say, God, I'm so glad for that diagnosis because it woke me up. Right. But wouldn't it be nice to have done that beforehand? And I think if we just set it up simple and made it not so daunting, one step at a time, an 80-20 rule, 
uh, one goal at a time, honestly, without guilt, we would probably climb that mountain a little bit more efficiently and quicker and we'd achieve the summit Mm -hmm. as opposed to making it as if we're going to quantum leap it. Right. I love that. And I agree with all, all that you've said there. Uh, if you can share with the audience how they can reach out to you. Oh, thank you. Yes. If you Google anything, the domino diet, you'll find me. Okay. <laughs> <a> rare title. <laughs> uh, basically, that's the best. I mean, I, I'm sure you'll be putting some links as well. My phone number, yes. people text me. I have a website, uh, okay. thedominodiet.com. <laughs> Domino Diet will, will pretty much help you find me. And I'm on Amazon. I'm apparently Ingrams and the Canadian way of getting me on chapters and so forth is still being worked out, but Amazon is definitely one way. Awesome. Okay. And we will put your website and uh, phone number, et cetera, in the show notes. So that's good. So people know how to reach you. And then just what would you suggest to someone or a tip or a message to don't delay, start on your healing journey today? If you're waiting for Monday, or New Year's, or the next New Year's, or the next year's, it's usually a paradigm, and it has a lot of fear. The subconscious is listening, and it wants to keep you in that comfort, as you've mentioned. But when you take a step, one step, drink more water, try a small breath, just one step, the subconscious starts to go, oh, you mean business. And you will begin to see other ones that are revealed to you very quickly. Going for a 10-minute walk, out your house means you have to 10 minute walk back. You've just done 20 minutes. It's a simple experiment. If you want to call it an experiment, but beginning a step rather than waiting for the perfect perfection is a form of delay uh, tactic in your paradigm world. So just begin a small step and then make the call or then make the connection with somebody like myself to help customize. I love that. Thank you so much. I just, I recently said something very similar. It's there is no best time to get started, but there is a perfect time and the perfect time is now. Yes. And let me just say the best wording I used for myself, even in writing a book, was, mm-hmm. don't take perfect action, take massive imperfect imper- action. Yes. Yes. That'll get you into progress. Exactly. I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today. And thank you to the audience for listening. And uh, look forward to having you back for the next episode of Don't Wait for Your Wake Up Call. 